everybody's having a great con uh, conference so far. Uh, I want to officially welcome everyone to Disney World, Land of Magic. <laughs> Only today we're actually going to do the opposite. We are at a place that prides itself on all of the magic, talking about a language that prides itself on its lack of magic. So let's be explicit in this case. The only thing that I actually want to talk about that might be magical are creating magical experiences, maybe for consumers or people. Um, part of that is inventing new products. And that's sort of where nerves falls in. That way we can have magical experiences, like times when you need your smartwatch to talk to your egg carton. You'll never be out on the grocery store again and not know the temperature of your eggs. This is smart eggs, everyone. Something we're going to just, just deal with it. <laughs> now, I, I actually kind of like these uh, uh, series of products that are coming out. A lot of people have some, they put some, it, you got to put some ideas into this place a bit. And uh, it's something that's sort of stirred up a lot recently with the big community, uh, especially where I started. I started as a maker. And times have never been better for makers. Things are moving fast and forward, and the tools that we're given to be able to create ideas like smart eggs uh, can actually uh, come to light because we have powerful frameworks and languages to get us there. One of the great things that we see these days is the ability to use Phoenix uh, to be able to rapidly create uh, connectivity with channels and presence. Uh, we can, uh, uh, that, that, the birth of the web in this case just begs for these devices to be connected to it. It's a whole new level of abstraction. An example of which is our session that we had for badge hacking. Uh, I have it actually running up here. It's, uh, uh, it's a, uh, a device that we attached to the back of the badge. We had a workshop for this. Uh, it runs on the uh, Linkit Smart Duo. It's a nice little tiny processor. And um, what it does on the display there is um, uh, it's connecting to Twitter. It's following some hashtags. And whenever a new tweet for that hashtag comes in, it displays it on the display for about 20 seconds. And then it'll go away and wait for the next one. This kind of stuff is really cool and powerful because it gives us the ability to now glue together the pieces of uh, the language. We have access to running so much on this little device. We're running Elixir. We're running Phoenix with a web interface. We're running connections with Twitter. And all of that on a Wi-Fi enabled chip at 580 megs with 128 megs of RAM. This kind of stuff is amazing. And as a maker, it really starts to accelerate people towards the point where they feel like they can actually produce quality products. And somebody came along and actually allowed me to do that. I was able to transition from a maker to a professional by somebody saying, I'll hire you and pay you money to do this. Hey, I'm a professional now. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, big thanks to Latote, actually. Um, we're hiring. Hmm? Uh, the best thing about Latote, actually, uh, it's been a really enjoyable experience. Not only now do we get to push forward on making NURBS what it really can become, a great platform for creating embedded products and systems, but uh, some of the fun experiences of working at Latote uh, uh, as a remote employee is that I get to combine dangerous activities with inappropriate workplace wear. The, uh, the other hard part about working remotely, actually, is, uh, and my wife can attest to this, that I, you just don't know when to stop. So it all blends together. Everything continues to work. And just power through it, and it'll eventually get there. Anyways, today I wanted to talk about some of the experiences that I've had along the way. Uh, and these experiences um, started out as my career as a maker, working towards uh, creating tools and systems that could uh, uh, help people create these devices easier. Um, originally from uh, trying to be able to uh, remote start my motorcycle from my iPhone, um, I decided it was really hard to be able to do that kind of connectivity with uh, the devices. And I wanted to work towards making it easier. So I joined up and, uh, uh, with uh, 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 Nerves and the rest of the team with Frank. And we all pushed forward to, uh, to create this. Um, 
being on the creation side of the language and framework is interesting, but then uh, working with Latote and being on the usage side was enjoyable, but it had exposed its painful pe uh, features of it. Some of those things uh, are, uh, first off, distributed artifacts. And um, we'll talk more about what an artifact is, but uh, we've had some experience uh, in the use cases of these things where um, when, when you're working with nerve systems, there's probably a lot of uh, um, uh, packages or artifacts that have a lot of weight, hundreds of megabytes in size. And uh, the distribution of these, as I'm speaking here, is to say that every time you'd start a new NERVS project, the same, you may be using the same artifacts to communicate with the same board, like a Raspberry Pi 3. Uh, and instead of those artifacts being centralized, they're going to get copied into every one of your projects. Uh, so this has its upsides and its downsides. Its downsides being that now computers are starting to move more towards solid state drives at lower capacities, and uh, a lot of people get angry when you start chewing down gigabytes worth of uh, disk space so you can produce tiny little 20 megabyte images that can run on your embedded devices. Another painful feature of this was the uh, development uh, life cycle. And, um, uh, this, uh, uh, if you've ever used nerves, it's it's uh, a little bit it's, it's a little bit tedious because you know you have this target hardware and and to really truly uh, understand that what you're producing will work, you have to run it on this target hardware and it's not necessarily a uh, uh, a proof that it's running when it's running on your host because it's a different environment. Something else that was painful is. Uh, NERVS brings with it systems, um, and uh, with these systems, uh, th we have these predefined systems that will handle uh, platforms like Raspberry Pi, Raspberry Pi 2, Raspberry Pi 3, uh, the BeagleBone Black, as you see with this badge, the Link at Smart. Uh, there's a great uh, list of them if you can visit on our GitHub pages and check out. And part of modifying systems has been, well, we give you these predefined ones, but you might want to extend them with some additional stuff, and, and the process of adding packages is a little bit painful for some. And in addition, enabling kernel modules. Well, uh, these are like you know, little drivers that uh, will run pieces of your hardware, and you may have uh, a wireless, little wireless dongle that you plug into your device, and uh, there's a million different kinds of wireless dongles that plug in and have a million different, maybe not a million, but tons of different drivers. Uh, and so from our approach, it's, it's a little difficult when we try to be able to produce these minimal systems to enable all of them so that all of them will work for you out of the box so we can only handle a few. And uh, uh, for those who are trying to use one that's not supported, well, you can turn it on, but it's a little bit painful to do it on some situations. And uh, finally, another one, too, that we have is uh, extending the tool chain. Well, our tool chains, uh, they support C, C++ uh, compilers, but uh, these days a lot of people want to be able to uh, uh, compile in different, a lot of different other languages. So these are the painful experiences. So today we're just going to talk about covering these in a top-level uh, uh, components. We're going to talk about artifacts. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, how we solve this uh, with package management, and we're going to talk about the development cycle. And uh, last, the, but the best pretty much is uh, getting everybody else to work towards contributing towards Elixir and Nerves, because it's not that difficult. So first, um, the packages and, and the artifacts. Well, as I said before, it's uncanny the size uh, of, of the weight of these distributed artifacts. At first, we just decided, well, disk space is cheap, so let's just allow this sort of uh, a pattern to exist. And it wasn't until further usage that we realized that, that these things started to accumulate. Uh, in this case, we have a, an image here of the accumulation. Uh, so uh, with NERVS, we build out to the build directory. Uh, we have our own NERVS directory in there, which contains some of the intermediates. And uh, if you are unfamiliar with some of these stages, uh, uh, you can certainly check out some of the other talks that we have, uh, 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 especially the one from me in uh, EU. Uh, it describes a lot of the build system and, and uh, where uh, the production of these, uh, um, uh, these assets. So in this case, we have the uh, tool chain and the system. And this is the sort of foundation of producing NERVS firmware. And as you can see here, it's 127 megs for the tool chain, 142 megs for the system, and that inevitably produces a, a Linkit image of about 15 megabytes. And it's startling when you think of these kind of things, how much 
in assets are required to produce such tiny little things. So the, the mentality here was, was, was a little skewed, I feel, because not only are we duplicating the download of tool chains and systems um, across projects, because if you think in this case, I'm going to create this little project that's going to do this little bit of work uh, for, the, uh, uh, for my link at Smart, and then a little later I'm going to go and create this other project. And it's just a little toy thing, and it's going to do this thing. Well, every time I create a new project, and mix firmware with them, I'm duplicating that 127 megabytes and that 142 megabytes, and things start to add up quickly. In addition, if I want to be able to leverage mix environment uh, to be able to say, okay, I want to build for dev now, and then I want to go and I want to build for prod, well, every time that you switch between environments, well, the build folder, as you can see uh, under the, uh, uh, there, it's a, uh, uh, there's a dev folder, well, then you're going to have one for every environment. So at that time, we're also going to take in the systems and the tool chains for that environment. And things also in the same project start to compound. Now, it's a little difficult to attack this problem right away. Um, we have some things in place that we're sort of inhibiting our ability to move towards a, uh, a way that we could easily share these. Uh, a while back, I came up with a, a concept that was released out into the wild for centralizing a local cache a, a, a construction. But it worked for systems, but it didn't work for tool chains. And the reason for this is because systems and tool chains are different. And the difference that we can see, if we look at, the, uh, uh, if we look at a systems project declaration itself, is that we uh, have a compiler that we add in for nerve system. And for tool chains, we have a compiler that we add in for nerves tool chains. So um, when it came time to say, OK, let's make this shared, uh, we, we laid out the groundwork and systems first. And where we started was we looked at the structure of what uh, this, this glue layer that we're calling nerves under system is. That's where that nerve system compiler lives. And we have this mentality where, well, we already try to save the time and energy on making you build the assets locally. Uh, and instead, we fetch them from the network. So you'll notice when using nerves that when you execute a request, uh, or when you execute a compile, if the, if the uh, assets don't exist on your system, it'll download them during that time, and it'll store them into the build directory. So we started to spec out, uh, we have here a, a local provider and an HTTP report provider. And we're like, oh, well, you know, let's, let's make it easy. Let's do the same thing for tool chains, because then that'll, fix, that'll, that'll make them both the same. And what ended up happening was we're like, oh, OK, well, all we have to do is take this code over here. And when we go and work on it for tool chains, we'll just put it over here. And well, when, you take, when, when you're copying stuff from one place to another, that's obviously a location for uh, an optimization. Um, when, you, when you try to be able to, uh, that, there's something that's related there. So the point that we ended up coming to was that we had to, uh, we had to, to somehow uh, create an abstraction that handled both cases. And in every way we decided that the best way to do this was to be able to get it so that the tool chain, uh, we had to take the tool chain and take the system and put them in a better environment. <laughs> so what did this look like? Well, uh, as I said, we have these two different Elixir compilers, both trying to perform the same task. So we decided in this case that we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go away from using the mentality of there being systems and tool chains, and we're going to work towards things just being a package. So this, uh, well, we're, the, the, uh, the next step in this case is to say, instead of these being different compilers, these are now going to use the NERVS package compiler. And depending on what type of package it is, it's just going to perform the operation properly. Uh, this was really interesting because not only, if you've noticed with NERVS, uh, 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 not only is there that size uh, problem, but we have a lot of repositories. And, and it's becoming more and more difficult to be able to manage uh, the, uh, the amount of uh, uh, the sheer number of repositories that, that we have in, in the, uh, uh, the scope. Well, we knew exactly where we needed to, to hook into this. 
So if you're a Nodes user today, uh, you may notice that every one of our packages ships with this uh, nodes.exs file. Uh, so this is a uh, package configuration file. And this file is really important because, uh, uh, in talking about this before, if you, if you, if you don't know how the nerve system works, well, under the hood, what it does is, uh, we have a special uh, time during the compiler phase called the pre-compile phase. And that's before any code on your computer is actually compiled. We can hook into that phase because when you're compiling a nerves application, you're always compiling for the target. And if we, and, and, and when we download our dependencies, if we need to know some information from the environment of the dependency, we would need to load it, which means we need to compile it, which means we're too late. So we include this file, this nerves.exs file, uh, which some of you may or may not have opened and peeked at, but um, we include this file to be able to give us a little bit of uh, 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 before compilation introspection into the dependencies on your system so we can easily identify which ones are nerves dependencies. Uh, this is what one of these files looks like today. Um, we haphazardly, in a sense, tried to lay this out with enough information that was required for us at the time to be able to satisfy the build engine. Uh, you can see here that this uh, just gives us some information like, oh, well, this is a type of, it's a, a system type. It's, uh, we know some information about its version so that we can look up uh, the artifacts locally. Uh, we have some, a list of places where we might be able to fetch this from, in this case, the mirrors. And uh, we also have some uh, information about some of the modules that might be required to be able to, to take this package and turn it into one of these artifacts. So we needed to make some changes here. This is the part where I say, things are changing. <laughs> so to be able to move us from systems and tool chains to packages, uh, we simplified things a little bit in the, uh, uh, the, the nerves uh, package configuration. Uh, we're now simplifying the platform by, by taking a lot of the code that's out there in sub-repositories like Nerve System and uh, bringing them up into uh, the, the, uh, the main Nerves application. Uh, we're making, uh, uh, with this, it, it's making it easier for us to be able to consolidate all of the build code into one location so that we can easily omit it from any of the releases uh, without having to flag warnings. As you uh, may have been here for Paul's talk earlier, we're also really excited to be able to be adopting, uh, and uh, to, to, to work towards adopting the new release system using distillery. Uh, there's gonna be some great advantages uh, there for us as well. But one important feature we're doing here now too is uh, we're going to, uh, we're gonna take the list of files that exists in the package and we're going to, in a similar fashion on how hex operates, uh, create a unique hash around the contents of those files so that we can use that as a, as a fingerprint towards identifying when the contents of a package might change. This is the freedom that we don't really have today with this because reproducing these packages is uh, really slow and difficult, and we'll see that in further slides. So currently, uh, we have uh, the other uh, aspect of this, too, is uh, that's the creation of it. Well, the, the, uh, the other aspect of this is what an artifact looks like. So a package is just a big lump of configuration information. And when we look at a system, that configuration information is just the configuration that's, that's uh, important to tell our system how to produce an actual Nerves Linux system. So one of the changes that we want to make here is we want to move away from the uh, uh, we want to move away from uh, this this bag of stuff and we want to add a little bit more structure to it so that we can do some interesting uh, uh, things. Um, we're going to split this into three sections pretty much where we have uh, anything that gets produced in a package that's part of the target file system will be part of the target fragment. And then anything that the package produces that you may need to use in your compiling time to be able to link to, uh, we're gonna put in the staging fragment. And then there may be anything that you need that's extra that gets put into the image uh, in the long term that gets put into the image fragment. So ultimately at, uh, now, with the new sharing uh, architecture for artifacts, uh, we're also gonna take one step to where when you download an artifact, 
using our system, instead of it getting downloaded into the build directory of your project over and over again for whatever environment you may be in, the artifact's actually going to get saved into uh, the home, we're going to put it in home.nerves artifacts. This way now, anytime you go to use them, uh, they'll always be available, they'll be ready to go, and they won't weigh tons and tons of megabytes on your machine. The other thing about this too is that we realize that sometimes you don't want to always pull these from hacks and you want to just play around with some stuff, or you might be in the process of developing your own system uh, or your own package, and at that point, any time that you're going to reference a git or a path dependency, uh, we're actually going to reference that from uh, where the dependency exists inside of your project structure so that it doesn't have the opportunity of iteratively d uh, polluting the global uh, uh, shared artifact pool. With this infrastructure in place, this allows us to do some really interesting things, one of which is package management. So with package management, uh, you may be thinking, well, there's already hex, and that's true. Um, and we're going to leverage this in a way by allowing you to do something similar to this. This is a, just a trivial example in this case, and, and uh, what you're going to see here is not something that's in place yet, but everything that we're talking about at this point is um, things that we're, we're going to be merging in, uh, uh, working towards uh, after the, the conference. Um, so in this case, uh, now that we, with package management and the new artifact structure, we can say, oh, I want to include Postgres in the uh, user land space of my, app, of my uh, NURBS uh, firmware. And what we do is, uh, because uh, artifacts, the way that artifacts work are, uh, with the Postgres package, uh, that can get compiled for a bunch of different architectures, like Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone Black or Linkit Smart. And for each one of those architectures, we have different tool chains. And those tool chains produce different binaries. And so even though you're getting Postgres from Hex, it's the package configuration on how to build Postgres. At pre-compile time, we're going to identify that that package, that you want to use that package, and then we're going to identify which tool chain you're using at that time based off the target you have selected. And then we're going to be able to go fetch the pre-compiled artifacts from a different cache. And essentially what this is going to uh, look like then is with everything being split up into all of the target fragments, it now gives us an incredible ability to be able to just chain them all together, merge them in place, and then that inevitably becomes your target image. And uh, now that all of that is smashed together, it'll just, it's similar to a lot of how other package management systems work for your desktop, but the beauty of this is that it'll be highly reproducible at compile time. And that, uh, as I mentioned before, is going to be uh, in conjunction with using this with Hex. Uh, we're going to let Hex do all the heavy lifting. Uh, we realize, uh, me especially, in conversations with Eric, that uh, uh, building package management, building uh, uh, dependency management systems, it's hard work. And, um, and so we want to be able to leverage all of the hard work that uh, Eric and, and the people on Hex have been doing. And then aside from that, we're just going to pull those artifacts from another location uh, from uh, our buckets that we store. So in upcoming releases, you can keep look at, uh, we're, we're, we're working towards creating this as a beta, so there'll probably be a few packages available that we'd like people to try out, uh, just to be able to work out some kinks in the system. Uh, but uh, this is definitely something that uh, uh, this, uh, the changes that we have staged are moving towards. Another thing that we want to tackle is the development life cycle. So here's where I want to be able to just uh, uh, have a, a quote in this case. This is one of my favorite quotes, something I usually say all the time. Future Justin's problem. <laughs> That's now Justin saying that. So things I talk about here are future Justin's problem. Well, uh, what do I mean by that exactly is that um, these are things uh, that, we're, that we're interested in tackling. Uh, I can't give you a definitive timeline on it. I'd hope that we'd be able to get there before the next time you see me, uh, uh, next conference or next year. Uh, but these are, these are things we've identified that we want to work towards fixing uh, for problems. And what I mean by the development cycle is um, when developing on your machine using NERVs, you're doing a lot of SD card swapping. And we know this. It can be tough. 
every time you make a change, you have to put the SD card in your machine, you have to mix firmware, mix firmware burn, and then when you burn the firmware to the target SD card, you take that out, you pop it in your machine, and your, uh, 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 your, your uh, Blinky, or your uh, Linkit Smart, or your uh, Raspberry Pi, and uh, you realize you forgot to add a module to the applications list, and the thing doesn't load. And you go back, you put it back in. Well, when working, well, since doing this now, being on the other side of the fence and doing this professionally, uh, I've, I've done a lot of it. I've practically written the book on SD card swapping. <laughs> like a boss. <laughs> so uh, at this point, uh, 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 I have some hypothetical ideas as far as an approach that can be taken for this. And uh, one thing is, well, there's two ways to handle this problem, in dev and in production. Uh, and, and I'm going to take the production side of things first. Uh, your hardware, let's say in production, it's remote. And you want to be able to push firmware to it. And you want to make sure that it, do, it doesn't fail in the field. And uh, uh, you want to make sure that when you push it, 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 it can fall back properly. Well, um, that's actually uh, a method that looks a little bit like this. You can see you'll mix your firmware, let's say, uh, you can create a firmware uh, bundle, and then uh, we have some libraries that are coming into play re uh, 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 more recently that uh, 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 Garth Hitchens has been working really hard and Chris Dutton on uh, for remote firmware updates. Uh, there's actually some tweets out there of people using it early on, um, but uh, you'll push it to this service that's on your device, and then that, that service interacts with the version of FWUP that's running on your node, and it inevitably updates the firmware on that device. The harder part of the cycle is if you have uh, it in dev mode. Well, in dev, it's a little different. We want to be able to iterate through our firmware a little bit easier. We want to be able to leverage things like, um, like what we're used to with Erlang, hot code reloading, things like that. Things should feel a little bit faster. Um, like Phoenix, when you can just type in some stuff and it will reload your modules. But there's some things that we have to consider here. I mean. We don't just have to take Erlang code or Elixir code and be able to reload it on your, on your uh, uh, device. We also have things like artifacts, in this case, that contain uh, user land packages or binary applications that need to be reloaded. Uh, in addition, there's uh, stuff that you might include that was compiled by C and C++. Uh, let's say you make a change in one of those, uh, and how do you reload something like that that exists outside of Erlang? Or if you're actually interfacing with it through a port, you know, what is the procedure? You restart the port, what services get restarted? But then ultimately the easier one is with the Elixir code. Well, with Elixir code, um, you can just probably reload it, but then if you reload the Elixir code, you have to reload any of the other submodules. And this can become problematic because pushing all of this stuff to the target device could have consequences. And those consequences when you're working with software is uh, let it crash, but maybe those consequences when working with hardware are a little bit different. <laughs> so with this to say that there's uh, some things that we have to consider and think about as we move forward towards trying to be able to solve the development cycle problem, and that is that we need to make sure that we can uh, do it in a way that we can handle the entire uh, gambit, um, which uh, may require different strategies for different uh, uh, situations. So we also had a problem with modifying packages locally. Here's a common situation, actually. Uh, as an Elixir developer, you might be going onto a support channel and be like, I'm having this weird problem where it's not compiling and something's wrong, but I don't quite get it. Uh, and then somebody kind of chimes in and they're like, hey, you have a major typo here. Like, just let's change this typo, and then everything is good to go. I fixed it in master. Just pull it from master. Well, this posed a problem with us because in, when pulling from hex, uh, those artifacts, you're downloading those artifacts that are at a stable place. And when, if you were to check out code that's marching forward in master, let's say from a system, well, there's no artifact associated with that, which would require you to have to produce it locally. And this may seem fine, but the problems that we have are that it, the time, it takes a really long time to be able to build one of these artifacts, one of these systems, uh, upwards of you know, 20, 30 minutes, depending on your internet connection and the amount of packages you have enabled. 
In addition, the, the portability is low. Well, what I mean by that is that uh, uh, the only, uh, since we're built on top of, the systems and packages are built on top of BuildRoot, uh, the uh, time, uh, the uh, uh, system you have to compile them on, it has to be on a Linux machine. Uh, so, and then at that point we decided with the providers, well, a lack of providers was to say, you can download them from the remote HTTP service, or you can build them locally on Linux, left a big gap in the way that it came to being able to build these yourself so that you could benefit from changes upstream. So what we have in place in addition that we're staging is support for our ability to run this through Docker. And this doesn't mean deploying to Docker. What this means is that we're just going to use it so that you can on your Mac, uh, uh, or uh, especially on your Mac, uh, use Docker to be able to build inside of the Linux environment. And uh, uh, you, can, you can then produce these artifacts uh, in a reproducible way that you would on a Linux machine. Well, uh, what uh, this looks like here is uh, uh, the defaults. So if you're, depending on what computer you're, or what machine you're on, we default to Docker versus uh, on Linux, we just default to allowing you to run locally. Uh, but we're also uh, uh, toying with a way that we can allow you to override the environment so you can say, you know what, I'm on Linux, but I still want to build this package using Docker, so let's pass the provider for Docker in there and make sure that that still runs. This opens the door for some really cool features as well. Uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, the systems themselves and building and build root, uh, we can do some neat things like uh, we can, on macOS, allow you to be able to get yourself to the shell for uh, uh, a package. So in this case, uh, if, if you wanted to add additional packages to the system, you, would, you can use a make menu config, which is an um, exposed build root command, that'll bring up the, uh, uh, the make menu config here, uh, as you can see on the bottom, uh, that allows you to be able to specify all the different options that are enabled for your system. So uh, this is uh, an example of saying uh, a command we'd be adding uh, that would say mix uh, nodes.shell, and that'll dip you into a shell at that package so you can make modifications. So ultimately, the, the, the life cycle of this is gonna change a little bit. We're gonna have our package, and we're gonna have our Docker container and our package dependencies, and we're just gonna push those into the container via linking them. And out the other end comes the artifact directory. Uh, it's gonna push the artifact back out to your host into the artifact directory. And to speed up this whole process, we're actually enabling a, uh, uh, a behind the scenes uh, Docker volume uh, that's the cache. So this is gonna make it so that, uh, th and this cache is gonna be shared between all of your different uh, artifacts, so that way if you wanted to change this system over here, and then you wanted to go and change this system over here, uh, the downloaded assets that they may share will be uh, already downloaded in the background, and it will also leverage uh, C compiler cache as well, if you have that enabled in your, uh, in your uh, 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 nerves package, in your uh, build root uh, def config. So what does this bring us? This brings us great support now. Not only can you build on Linux, but you can also build on Mac OS, and uh, we haven't quite tested the Windows support yet, but uh, Greg Mefford on the uh, team, he's been doing a lot of work on uh, getting FW up to work on Windows, along with Frank Hunleth, uh, and they've been uh, 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 getting it to the point where we can finally support a lot of different systems coming out. And the reason I'm telling you a lot of this is because we were trying hard to be able to allow people to, to use new devices and peripherals along with their nerves nodes, like touchscreen displays. Imagine if you, like, uh, that you could uh, create your Phoenix application and instead of having to run it as a web interface, you could actually run it on the touchscreen. The complications here, we had to solve first. And that was allowing us to be able to build on multiple platforms before we could end up tackling the issues with, that came along with enabling all these different kinds of su uh, supports for displays and uh, uh, touchscreen interfaces. And essentially, that the, uh, one of our goals uh, as well is uh, when we produce your firmware, 
uh, you can imagine that there's a, a great deal of which lives in the user land. Like, uh, imagine running, an Apple, uh, running Elixir on your computer, on your host computer. Well, you're running Elixir, but alongside of that, you may be running underneath the scenes uh, some additional programs, like, in, like Postgres. And Postgres is something that's going to be the user land application, and Elixir is going to have a lot of uh, Elixir-based things. Well, our goal here is to be able to move more from the user land towards my new favorite thing, Elixir land, which is feeling kind of like Disneyland, but only better. <laughs> so uh, this is a big goal, but we think that we can uh, uh, work towards this and bite off more of it by including more of the community. And by bringing support to all these different platforms, finally gives us a utility towards bringing more and more people in as contributors so that we can work towards moving these lower level land facets up into Elixir because that's the place where you really want to be when you're working with initialization or running your code. So at this point, I want to talk about uh, hypotheticals, uh, or as, as Chris earlier today likes to put them, things that may happen in the next year. This is future Justin saying it's future Justin's problem, passing the buck. There's been a lot of talk about how people want to move away from C and C++ because they feel like it's inhibiting their abilities of programming uh, these systems faster. Now, that's a grain of salt because there's strategies that may require you to be able to use, uh, to dip out and use those for speed or performance. Uh, but with newer languages these days, people want the ability of running Rust and Go or any other host-based compile uh, that they want. So this is a concept that we're calling toolchain extensions. Right now our toolchains ship with the ability of creating uh, C, C++ code, compiling it for the target and runs on your host. Uh, well, this is, as we were saying, something we're toying with for down the line. Uh, we'd really like to be able to bring support in for Rust and Go, but the complications here are that uh, as I mentioned earlier, everything for NERVs is compiled for the target. So if we were to include toolchain extensions as dependencies, the difficulty is that the uh, toolchain dependencies are actually for your host to compile for the target. But then uh, if you bring them in as extensions, uh, as dependencies, there's a potential that they're going to end up getting fed into the system. And you're going to inevitably maybe try to compile a toolchain that's meant to run on your host for the target. So to get around this, we have one potential solution we've been playing with, which is to leverage the ability for us to segregate uh, dependencies via a mix environment. And the concept here is to say that, uh, OK, so if all of your host dependencies will only get fetched for, for mix environment host, that would be all your toolchain extensions, but then all your target dependencies would get fetched whenever you're running in test, dev, or prod. This requires a two-step phase where you'd be like, okay, I have to fetch all my dependencies for host before I can fetch my dependencies and move on iteratively for dev or test. There are complications with this system, but like I said, these things are being worked out, and this is totally future, future Justin's problem. So I have to say that we couldn't do all of this without contributors like you. The idea is that People shouldn't be afraid of embedded development. It's actually strikingly easier than you uh, may, may think um, because it's software in this case. A lot of people here can really get started contributing today by writing libraries to interface with different services or different hardware. For example, we have a page up on our website for community libraries that seems to be growing every day. Uh, it includes additions from all across the community, including uh, professional, or uh, I should say, uh, production uh, uh, additions from uh, places like the National Association of Realtors. I believe Chris is here. Uh, there he is. You can talk to him later about his use cases as well and how he's been using it. And, uh, you know, Garth and others ship in production. Also at Latote, we ship uh, uh, devices and use them in production. Uh, and if you have questions about how to get started, you can always join the Elixir Lang Slack community group uh, and uh, join the Nerves channel on there. We're highly active. Uh, you can ask questions, get information, help. Uh, if you need advice on hardware, there's a great group of people that uh, have lots of opinions. Um, and then ultimately, too, we have some great documentation that we started putting up that need, that's ever-growing and needs more and more work. 
uh, every day. So read the docs. If you have problems with them, contribute some pull requests. Uh, it's really easy. And also, anybody who's in our community that loves nerves and is great at web development, or even good at web development, we'd love if you can contribute to being able to make our website better. Uh, we really could use some overhauls, and uh, it's tough asking a group of embedded developers for web help, but <laughs> that's where Phoenix gets the benefit a lot. So stop in, check out our docs, get started, ask us questions, and if you have any problems, uh, just find one of us uh, during the conference. Thank you. I believe we have a little time for questions. Anybody have any uh, NERVS questions, right? Yes, we do. So NERVS is predominantly for embedded Linux systems? Uh, so yeah, NERVS is uh, um, uh, geared to targeting uh, yeah, embedded uh, systems development. There's a great lack of uh, uh, robustness in that field, uh, but it's really good at cross-compiling. So uh, there has been a lot of uh, talk in the community of people using it for other methods, but um, yeah, right. We're, we're focused on building better embedded systems. Okay. Uh, the the GUI stuff. Um, have you guys made any plans with that uh, to do embedded GUIs, or uh, what are your thoughts around that? Yes. Uh, so. Um, we started tackling that problem by tackling the problems that, uh, that, that sit underneath that problem, uh, and that, that proved to be a lot of work in itself, which is uh, part of the, uh, the issue with uh, building locally and package management. Those two features are going to bring a lot uh, more, uh, a, a greater ability for us to be able to extend the base, uh, because the GUI, uh, the web interfaces, uh, brings in a, a heavy payload. Um, and that heavy payload we didn't want to bring into the main systems, but we also didn't want to have to force people to compile it, because I've compiled it myself. It, compi it takes a long time to build. Uh, yeah, 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 it's based on WebKit, uh, the one that we're playing with. And um, uh, we, have, uh, 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 we have some people, a lot of people that are interested in pushing that forward, and uh, now with uh, our focus moving more towards uh, making development easier in package management. I'm sure that's going to make it easier for the community to be able to participate in assisting with the creation of that, uh, that level as well. So. Hi, Justin, uh, curious. Uh, so I know NERVS is still pretty young and hasn't, <laughs> hasn't quite reached 1.0 release yet. Uh, so I'm wondering which future Justin do you think <laughs> gets to release 1.0? <laughs> Uh, so, uh, uh, um, I believe we've, uh, the, the team, we've had a conversation about this and, and, you know, no promises. This is the empty promises section. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we're, we're, we're really working hard towards trying to get towards a 1.0 stability, uh, hopefully by the middle of next year, hopefully by the, the next Elixir Conf. Um, there is a great deal of work to do to be able to get there, uh, but, uh, uh, we're trying to be able to focus on it one piece at a time and, and, and push towards uh, next year for that. Fantastic. That's all the time we have for questions. So please give Justin a huge round of applause. Thank you.